Hi, everybody. I have Fluffy, the other part of Dear Chocolate that I've introduced for the last couple of weeks. And so I am introducing Dear Fluffy, who is a clown, who is a wonder, who is the miracle of life that we love about all things on this planet that are unpredictable and wondrous in their natural way. And uh, I'm going to put him down so maybe he'll jump up on that bookcase that all of you keep track of. We'll see. We don't ever know what Fluffy is going to do. But I have a very interesting report tonight, and that is about the mystery of what in the world has been happening in Sunspot, New Mexico. And this is a mystery that has been unfolding for the past week. And let's start off with that, where is it located? It's located in the Sacramento Mountains, uh, down in the southern portion of New Mexico. And it's on the eastern border of Alamogordo in Otero County. Since World War II, Alamogordo has been closely linked to Holloman Air Force Base and the White Sands Missile Range, which tests weapons and rockets for the Department of Defense, as well as for foreign countries, which could open it up to international spies, sabotage, and that could threaten national security. And I'll be talking more about that later in this broadcast. Well, what else is there is nearby Holloman Air Force Base. It occupies more than 52,000 acres and is Otero County's largest employer. 65% of Alamogordo's residents are connected in work to the base. Holloman and White Sands have been intertwined with each other since World War II as a bomber training base with centers for rockets and aerospace research. White Sands has also been the location for the United States Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division, which now oversees launch operations for suborbital space systems and research rockets. So we're talking about an extremely important Department of Defense area in the United States when you're talking about White Sands, Holloman, and where this National Solar Observatory is based on one of the uh, Sacramento mountains that looks right down onto White Sands and Holloman and that area. Now, what is probably unknown to a lot of people is that the National Solar Observatory has one of the finest telescopes in the world. It is called the Dunn Solar Telescope, and it was built first in 1969, and it was upgraded in 2004 with very high quality optics. It's at 9,200 feet on Sacramento Peak, and the observatory is about 18 miles south of Cloudcroft. It has a long pyramidal shaped tower that projects upward into the sky, and that is att attached to a much larger underground base. The telescope helps astrophysicists study magnetism on the sun's surface. And it is funded by the National Science Foundation, operated and managed by the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, known as Aura. And in 2018, it came also under management by the New Mexico State University that so far has not made any comment about this growing mystery of why on September 6th was the National Solar Observatory shut down by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And not only was the observatory shut down, but the local post office in a residential house was shut down by the FBI as well. Some people, I think rightfully so, are contemplating the possibility that there could be some kind of spy operation or computer hacking operation or something has happened to threaten national security for the FBI to come in, close things down, and not make any comment. Well, this is why tonight 
we're raising this question. Why did the FBI arrive at the observatory, order it closed, place yellow caution tape at its entrance, close down the local sunspot post office located in the private residence, and it is now September 12th, a week later. As of yesterday, the reporters in that area say the yellow tape was still at the entrance, the observatory is still closed to the public, and any local resident mail for the estimated maybe 40 people live in the general sunspot region. That whoever was getting mail through the residential post office, now they have to drive 60 miles to Cloudcroft to get their mail. And not one single explanation to anybody has surfaced yet about why has this occurred. Here is the only official statement made by anyone in authority. This was on Friday, September 7th by Sherry Lifson. She is a spokesperson for the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, known as Aura. She is based in Washington, D.C., and this is the sum total of the very strange release. Quote, the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy, who manages the Sunspot Solar Observatory facility, is addressing a security issue at this time. We have decided to vacate the facility at this time as a precautionary measure. That implies in anticipation of something. It was our decision to evacuate the facility, almost as if arguing that they made a decision and then the FBI came in instead of the other way around. It's not clear. I am actually not sure when the facility was vacated. These are the words in the same press release that makes it sound like Aura did something that was in anticipation and that they called the shots, but everybody else said the FBI shut up and shut everything down. I am actually not sure when the facility was vacated, but it will stay vacated until further notice. It's the people that vacated. At this time, it's the facility that is closed. Close quote. It's a lot of words that seem to say not very much. Well, last night, I interviewed investigative reporter Mauricio Casillas at WVIA-TV, the ABC affiliate network in El Paso, Texas. <clears throat> he did the first reporting about this mystery on Friday, September 7th, after the FBI had showed up the day before and closed down the Sunspot Solar Observatory and the local post office on Thursday, September 6, 2018. Here now is Mauricio Casillas, KVIA TV reporter in El Paso, Texas, in the interview with me. Thank you. 
you in the prepared statement. This observatory is located about 15 or 16 miles south of Spot Cross in New Mexico, in the Sacramento Mountains. The Otero County Sheriff's Office is in charge of the area. So I reached out to Otero County, and I said, hey, we're just trying to figure out what exactly is going on. What I heard from them was that the FBI had given them the heads up that the observatory was being evacuated. The FBI did not specify why or what was going on. So even the local sheriff's office didn't know what was happening. Everything about this is different from the norm of what we've been used to when we report. Yes, and let me quote back to you by Constitution.com that the sheriff is furious about the silence from the 40s and says, Otero County Sheriff Benny House said, quote, the FBI is refusing to tell us what's going on. We've got people up there at Sunspot that requested us to stand by while they evacuated. Nobody would really elaborate on any of the circumstances as to why. The FBI was up there. What their purpose was, nobody will say. But for the FBI to get involved that quickly and be so secretive about it, there was a Black Hawk helicopter, a bunch of people around antennas and work crews on towers, but nobody would tell us, the sheriff's office, anything. They wanted us up there to help evacuate, but we went up there and everything was good. There was no threat. Nobody would tell us what we we're supposed to be watching out for. Close quote, the Otira County Sheriff, Benny House. I just think this whole situation is extremely bizarre. The fact that the FBI is diverting questions back to Aura. Aura is telling us they can't say anything. The spokesperson for the U.S. Postal Service is saying we don't know. This is the first time I've encountered it in my career where something is so open-ended and there's no sense of haste from any of these organizations to clear that up. Now, this morning, I received an email that stated, quote, National Solar Observatory mysteriously closed as geomagnetic storm looms, close quote. And with this announcement, it gave half a dozen solar observatory locations ranging from Australia and Chile and Spain to Hawaii and Pennsylvania. And the email implied that there was some kind of organized shutdown of solar observatories, including sunspot in New Mexico because of some upcoming storm on the sun. That made no sense to me, and I got in touch with my trusted colleague and author Peter Lavenda. I asked him if he could do some searches of the listed solar observatories to see if any were posting shutdowns, and he found nothing unusual except the unexplained closure of the National Solar Observatory in Sunspot, New Mexico. Peter emailed me, quote, closing an observatory does not defend against a solar storm. The American feds can't shut down foreign observatories, so any attempt to interdict data coming from Sunspot would be futile because other observatories would start reporting whatever unusual activity they saw. Reports were not would not be controlled by the United States. And there are about a dozen observatories around the world that specialize in solar observations. As far as I can tell, the ones in Asia and Europe are all up and running normally, and that is not counting the space-based telescopes, close quote. And then it was only about an hour or two after that that I discovered that the Drudge Report had picked up that same email with that same implication, uh, listing the observatories and saying uh, that they were all shut down and that a sunspot was not the only one. That is not true. This was not true. Doing vetting on what uh, the list of the observatories were found nothing anomalous except sunspot. I do not know why uh, the Drudge Report picked up this uh, very, very off-base email. Well, then was the question about the role of the FBI in all of this. And uh, Peter, in trying to help me, did a search at the Quora website for FBI jurisdictional issues. 
Now, here is professional feedback about FBI jurisdictions, which may at least give some insights as to why the FBI would have been called. Not the answer for what happened, but why the FBI would have jurisdiction. One of the writers was is the former editor-in-chief of Elsevier, a very professional website, and this is from uh, former editor-in-chief Tim Dees. He said, if the FBI had an investigation that took them onto a military installation, they would contact their investigative counterparts within that base, who would in turn make the necessary arrangements for them to proceed. Likewise, if one of the military investigative agencies needed a resource by the FBI, they would make a phone call to the nearest resident agency or field office, and then things would be worked out between them. Now, Department of Homeland Security, a special agent now retired, Dan Robb, he wrote, when I was in the Na uh, Naval Investigative Service, known as NIS, it was the predecessor of the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, known as NCIS, there was regular liaison with the FBI. The FBI has the prerogative of assuming jurisdiction over any case more appropriately handled in federal court in cases involving a civilian suspect. Now, the military services have jurisdiction for and designated elements to conduct counterintelligence investigations to include covert operations, sometimes referred to as a dangle, wherein a military member is offered to an opposing intelligence agency as a double agent. These are com commonly done with the continuous FBI liaison. Paul Nelson, former retired law enforcement officer and correctional officer, wrote, Military police and the JAG Corps has jurisdiction over military personnel and bases. However, if the crime involves civilian suspects, the FBI is usually called in and they work with the military authorities. Civilian crimes on bases and other federal properties are investigated by the FBI. Crimes on non-military properties can include both violations of federal and state laws. Local departments investigate for state law crimes while the FBI investigates for federal crimes. Suspects can be charged and prosecuted in both systems, but usually they will be prosecuted in one and the other will hold off until the results are known. Well, along those lines, Five hours or so ago today on September 12th, the website What's Up With That, known as WUWT, had a headline, Weird, FBI Closes National Solar Observatory Over Mysterious Security Issue. And then what they report is that there could be something happening about a Chinese group getting some kind of infiltration into the National Solar Observatory and that if there was an effort by a Chinese group to use the observatory as a cover for their listening to White Sands Missile Range, that that might be the national security issue and why the FBI and no one is talking. And that tonight, as we uh, are now trying to get to the bottom of this, it may be that this most recent, and it's all it is, is now a speculation, perhaps based on somebody's reporting, that if, there, if, this, uh, if the National Solar Observatory was being used as a front or somebody inside of it is getting money, from a Chinese operation to listen to White Sands and those military operations that are down below Sacramento Peak. That might explain this mystery, but the way it has been handled has been so unusual. And just about an hour and a half ago, I talked with Mauricio at the uh, ABC affiliate in El Paso 
and their assignment editor was working the phones this afternoon trying to see if they could get any more comments from anyone and no one is talking. So this is a mystery and that the answer might be in these rumors just this afternoon that there could be a Chinese hacking or spying connection, but there is still no proof. And the very fact that the Otero County Sheriff is so upset that he was asked to go to the observatory to provide some kind of security, but no one would tell him. The uh, sheriff that would have jurisdictional responsibilities for all kinds of things in his county was excluded from any discussion with the FBI about what was happening. So this is one of those stay tuned stories. By next Wednesday, I hope that I'll have an answer. And if it is China spying, uh, we are in a new age where the computers and observatories and telescopes and, and satellites are all going to be vulnerable to the possibility of someone wanting eyes and ears beyond their national borders trying to use technology to their advantage. This may be in that category of some kind of spying with all of our sensitive White Sands, Holloman, and the naval operation down below Sacramento Peak. Now, with that as the lead of very interesting news tonight, uh, Lori, I'd like to segue over into questions uh, and uh, take whatever questions on this story. I may not have anything more to report, but if you have other questions about all these subjects that we keep bringing up on the YouTube channel, uh, I would love the dialogue with you tonight. Great. Our first question is, Linda, do you think this place is connected underground to the other bases in and around New Mexico? That is an excellent question. What I'm going to say, I wish I could prove. And we find ourselves so often in these difficult subjects where I am maybe firsthand removed or secondhand removed in discussions. And that's the category of this. It was a few months ago that I was talking with a whistleblower having to do with work that they had done in California and Nevada underground. And I asked the question, in the abduction syndrome, where I have interviewed people who have either in memory, like a breakthrough in memory, or in dreams, or a vivid flash where there will be frames. Some people, it comes in in frames, in, like in their mind's eye. And they will say that they suddenly will have a recall. It might be really short but they have a recall of being inside of something that they said was tubular. They felt they were underground, felt they were on earth, and that moved very fast. And then they came out into some kind of a facility, whether it was a lab or something. Well, that's, that's been kind of in the background in the human abduction syndrome going all the way back to when Bud Hopkins and I uh, were sharing information me in the animal mutilations, he was investigating human abductions, and we both would get information about underground facilities, and he would have uh, hypnosis sessions or dreams about these kind of underground tunnels. So uh, just a few months ago, with that as background, I asked this whistleblower who said that they had worked underground in both Nevada and California. And I asked if there was any truth to this idea that there was some complex network of underground shuttles that could connect Area 51 to China Lake to uh, the Area 29 is supposed to be in New Mexico on White Sands. I did a report about that uh, a couple, three, four months ago. It's at Earth Files. You can just uh, do a search on Area 29. 
That was with uh, the Dr. Bob Wood's son, Ryan. And the answer I was given was that yes, that there was a network that connected these bases and that the whistleblower had only been in one or two. And so he was speculating about what he had heard about a large network of underground tubes that move very quickly between various underground labs and bases. So what I need is if anybody listening has firsthand information, documentation, photographs, architectural uh, engineering drawings from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whenever they, these were first started and built. The reason why we go back in time, I do have a map that was given to me and it showed the date as 1948 in Nevada of the beginning construction of underground something at what we know as Area 51. These are pieces, these are pieces of a puzzle. We just don't have the whole coherent proved layout of a timeline, what was built when, and when and how would large underground subways, let's call them, be built between all these bases. Uh, we need firsthand whistleblowers who can try to prove and bring more information. So, uh, as I've said many times, you can email me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com to make a connection. And then we can move to other ways to communicate. I always, always honor requests for confidentiality. And I, like a lot of investigative reporters, whether we're in Washington dealing with the administration or uh, it is someone like me trying to understand the truth about an alien presence on this planet and throughout the solar system and what our government knows and why it covers up. Uh, it's very valuable to hear from those of you who may have firsthand knowledge. So I uh, ask again for help from people who have legitimate documents, legitimate firsthand experiences as whistleblowers. And thank you for that excellent question. And Lori, is there another one? Absolutely. The next one is, what do you think the most likely places the fast radio burst could be coming from? Anything natural that would not only cause this, but repeat and last that long? Thank you. Go to Earth Files, type in the search bar, fast radio bursts. I've done, I think, three or four in-depth reports. And the most important for me was my interview with Avi Loeb. He is chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard University. He was one of the first to come out with a paper that was published with his hypothesis that the fast radio bursts are the first evidence, this is hypothesis, not proved, are the first, uh, what would be light speed transports and the location keeps uh, remaining the same in, in the work that he's done. Three billion light years from Earth. It's a small galaxy. This is where they have focused on the fast radio bursts. I know that there have been other animation suggesting that we are getting fast radio bursts from throughout the universe. That may be true, but Avi Loeb's work was focused on a small dwarf galaxy, three billion light years from Earth, and his hypothesis that those fast radio bursts are the first evidence of light speed transport. He even went into the hypothetical possibility that the transportation could have been tied into what the Japanese now are going to start experimenting with on Earth, where there are elevators that go from the surface of a planet up to a transport, and that the elevator system 
is used so that the transport that's going to go light speed never has to come down to the planet. It's up. There's an elevator system that goes up. All kinds of supplies go through these elaborate elevators up to the waiting craft. And then the waiting craft removed from the planet takes off in some speed and then gets up to light speed. That is part of the star shot uh, imagination now of how things might work as we go into research and investigations of getting lasers to push little craft, small craft, toward Alpha Centauri to start out with. And they may try this in the next two years. And the idea is you get these lasers and you can read all about it. You can see the photos and the illustrations in my work at earthfiles.com. And if you get lasers pushing a small craft, think of your iPhone, that it's pushing, the light is pushing something as small as your iPhone, but the iPhone is loaded with the kind of computer software that you would need when you want to get photographs, let's say, of a planet orbiting Alpha Centauri. And you launch these and you get these photographs and then you have it aimed signals that will be coming back. It might take eight years to get photographs of another planet or that would be at the speed of light, maybe 30 years to get there at 20, 30 percent the speed of light and then get a return of the images doable in the lifetime of a single scientist. That's what they're hoping. And that the laser, the idea of getting laser light pushing these small craft, 30 percent the speed of light, 40 percent the speed of light, 50 and so on as we evolve our technology, could mean that eventually we would be able to use lasers uh, to propel, let's say, communication to Mars in uh, eight minutes. And that would be our connection between Mars and Earth uh, using these uh, lasers to propel these craft at uh, faster and faster speeds. So if you take what we're already trying to do on the Earth in Project Starshot and you apply to what we're picking up from these fast radio bursts three billion light years away in that one particular dwarf galaxy. Avi Loeb at Harvard is hypothesizing it could be the same type of technology getting cargo craft transports up to the speed of light. And then maybe even faster if they know how to move dimensionally, they can do cushion shots out of the matter universe into another dimension and then pop back in this one so that three billion light years might be handled in five minutes through a doorway. That's science fiction version, but maybe that's where everything is headed eventually. What about another question? You bet. Does Linda think that geoengineering is involved in the hurricane, uh, Hurricane Florence? I've gotten emails suggesting that. I guess inside of me, in my soul even, that when I even try to contemplate that any fellow humans would engineer something as horrific as Hurricane Florence will be hitting Myrtle Beach tomorrow night, if if the winds are 120 miles an hour or up, depending upon the strength of that hurricane, there's going to be such destruction in Myrtle Beach. It will be like a war zone. I just can't imagine doing this on purpose. So maybe, maybe it is feasible, but I don't know that. Maybe there are humans capable of carrying out war in weather, but I don't know that, and I hope it's not true. So another question. You bet, and before we go any further, of course, as always, thank you so much for everyone who supported us tonight with their super chats, thank uh, you. Yes, thank you very, very much. 
So our next question is, can you ask Linda about the upcoming usage of terahertz frequencies for 5G telecommunications? It is not a subject that I yet fully understand. I am working on it, and in fact, in my conference presentations in 2019, I already have started outlining a program in which I will be trying to the best of my ability with the help of scientists that I interview to flesh out terahertz, what it does at specific frequencies and what it does at high frequencies and how it probably relates to what is called artificial engineering at the subatomic level of materials like the bismuth, magnesium, zinc I've investigated since 1996. We already know that terahertz frequencies have been implicated in the Project Condine DI-55 science and technical study in which John Burroughs was the first to receive that information in the context of his damaged heart when he had to have open heart surgery to survive in 2013. And that terahertz is different from megahertz and other hertz frequencies that can be written about, terahertz has been identified as frequencies that can damage human tissues and manipulate human minds. We're in kind of the frontier. It is becoming a word that we're all beginning to use and ask questions about. We know that terahertz frequencies are used in the airports in those machines where you have to go in and do this, that's terahertz frequency. What I don't know, and actually I've talked to some scientists who say they don't know either. When you get up into these high, high frequencies that terahertz can range, then it has to do with the subatomic, it, it's so high and the frequencies are so tiny that this is how they can be used to manipulate at the subatomic level. And that may be one of the doors into what we'll call technology that has been described by government insiders as alien production, alien creation. And we are trying to duplicate it. And it may be that it is still beyond our ability to do that. But that terahertz is a window that we are already functioning with in airports, probably functioning in a lot of other ways. And that throughout this coming 2019, I will be trying to open up facet after facet after facet about terahertz and the whole issue of alien presences being able to use frequencies such as terahertz for a process at the subatomic level that can open up to neutralizing gravity. That seems to be one of the holy grails to try to understand and humans in government, black projects, white world, Everybody wants to know how can you control gravity? How can you neutralize it? How could you lift a stone as heavy as five tons and on? Our ancient past, it's been described that that is how the pyramids were actually built and not by slaves pulling ropes. Well, we are at that intersection of revolution we all want proof. We all want to understand how it works. The black space, secret space program may already have it. Now we need it in the white world. And that's what I and a whole lot of others are working for and hoping that we will see. So keep coming to Earth Files YouTube channel and um, we will hopefully keep moving forward together in trying to understand some of these big, huge physics and technology challenges together and know 
I am going to be working on this specifically in 2019. What about another question? Here's another one for you. Linda, you used to talk about the simulation theory. Do you still subscribe to this? I think that Elon Musk just recently said without any caveat that he's pretty much convinced that this is a simulated universe. There are more and more papers that keep coming out, nibbling around this whole issue. Are we living in a simulated universe? I think that I am beginning to feel like some kind of evidence is building up, but I always come up against this uh, th this other part that goes part and parcel with it. if we're in a simulated universe, where is it being projected from? If it is a holographic universe, which is what Michael Talbot wrote about in the early 90s in his book, The Holographic Universe, and told Bud Hopkins the whole book was downloaded from extraterrestrials that he was interacting with. The holographic universe, read it. Get the Michael Talbot book, The, the Holographic Universe. If that is true, then physicists who are studying this with great interest say if it were a holographic universe, then it has to be projected from another dimension. Which dimension? How is it projected? Who would have the reason to project this? And if it is, what is the agenda? What is the ulterior goal? What is the test in this laboratory of a simulated universe. Then move over to the abduction syndrome again. For the last 40 years, in all of the interviews that I've done with about 1,600 people in the abduction syndrome, over and over and over again, you will hear, it has something to do with our souls, Linda. It, they're, they're, they're studying how we live how we die, where the souls go at the moment of death. If that is the big game of the projected universe, then the idea that the Gnostics and others had, that the part that humans have that other life forms may not have is we have souls that reincarnate and get out that there is a recycling of souls. Some people argue, well, if there's a recycling, then that means the soul keeps coming back into this matter universe. Isn't that just a, uh, an extended, you get out, but you have to come back? Well, there are others who argue that yes, there may be a recycling of souls and that in the recycling of souls, information becomes stored and layered in the souls that come in and out of this specific matter universe. But in the end, it may be that upon choices that keep getting closer and closer and closer to alliance with the divine field and to light, that the souls reach a point, as the Buddha used to say, you lose all desire in the matter universe and then you evolve into the divine field where there is no neat reason to come back into the matter universe again. Whatever the big truth with a capital T is, I've said before, I personally am convinced there is a divine field. And in that divine field, there is no entropy. There's no winding down of energy. It is a steady state, an alpha to the omega, an infinity of divine light, and that it is ultimately responsible for all layers of all matter universes, all dimensions, and that that is what ultimately has the decisions about what happens to the precious souls that go out into all these matter universes, even if those matter universes some of them might be an experiment by other intelligences that are trying to understand entropy, the decline, 
Some matter universes may go to death and other matter universes may not. That there are directions of time. The vector of time can go to the future. The vector of time can go to the past. In those two opposites, one universe, there would be no death, incomprehensible to us. And in another universe, there would be. Perhaps all of it, like huge facets of a peacock spread tail, all of it is being experimented with and studied by an incomprehensible intelligence that actually cares that souls in the end would choose the divine field and the divine light. And I live with that as my sort of largest box because of all the, all the incidents in my life that have saved my life, that have inspired me in which I have had interactions with light, not matter. And I always keep in front of me a book by David Bohm, the famous physicist, called Wholeness and the Implicate Order. I recommend it to anybody and everybody <coughs> to read David Bohm's book and to underline and keep in front of you one of his most important sentences in this very important book. All mass is frozen light. In that truth, you, I, matter, are ultimately one with the light, the photons. We are just at different frequencies. In that context, then alien intelligences trying to interact with us in this universe, some as allies and some may be hostile, but they are matter in a, some kind of form that something has put into motion. And it may all be in this big question. Matter learning how to relate to divine light, evolve into divine light, and that reincarnation is the machinery as a whistleblower communicated to me long ago. Reincarnation, the recycling of souls, is the machinery of this universe. And in that, I feel a comfort. I have never felt fear. I feel energized by the idea that this huge matter universe and all consciousness in it the quantum consciousness of it all, it's all connected. If we just could see it, feel it, live it, how could we possibly murder another human being or kill an animal? Maybe that's the big challenge. <clears throat> and why I am, I go through this every September, Juniper, um, my brother and I are tremendously allergic to, to juniper. I'm allergic to many things, but this is September, and so my voice will come and go. I hope it's not too irritating. And I am trying to take allergy medicine to get by, but it does come. And on that note, Lori, because the juniper is starting to overtake me, I'm going to say thank you to everybody tonight who has been here, and I hope that some of you who may have insights about what is happening at Sunspot New Mexico in the observatory will get in touch with me uh, privately and that on all of these matters, I look forward. I am getting some of the most extraordinary emails of my entire professional career now. I am getting emails from those of you who are coming on Wednesday nights to the YouTube channel. I'm getting emails from physicists ex-military, ex-intel, uh, medical people. They are amazing emails. I'm going to start doing earth files in which I am 
going to lay out some of these extraordinary emails. And it seems to me it is part of what feels like a revolutionary time. There are so many people who have been exposed to facets of an alien presence, past, present, and coming in the future. And they feel in these amazing emails that I'm getting is the expression, all of the human family should know the truth about ourselves, our relationship to an alien presence in the past, in the present, and into the future where we are headed one way or the other, either combined as a human family that's going to make it to Mars and beyond without war, or perhaps we will continue in a self-destructive path and then something else will replace us. I hope that we all opt to look at each other and everything around us. As David Bohm said, all mass is frozen light. If you can see that, if you can feel that, you must live with a different frame of reference that cannot go to violence. So on that, Lori and Michael, thank you for tonight. Uh, we'll keep on trucking next Wednesday. I look forward to seeing you all here. And uh, my thank you to Peter Lavenda. Uh, his interview last week was so important. And I apologize for the problem we had on the mic. Uh, we're working to try to add audio interviews and more and more if we can get our whole uh, YouTube channel system uh, working in many facets. Hang in there with us. We are trying, and I'll have Peter Lavenda back at another time when we have clear audio. But I know from all of the emails that I did receive that Lori and Michael did bring up the volume, and most people have heard it, and I have had tremendous feedback on the very, very important subjects that we will continue to explore with Peter Lavenda and others who will come through Albuquerque and my office, and we will do live Wednesdays when, with them when we can. Thank you, everybody, from me, from Chocolate, from Fluffy, and honoring Earth life in the most positive way. <laughs>